is going to require a preface of sorts. Uh, we're going to deal with some um, gnarly, for lack of a better word, uh, and difficult psalms that deal with troublesome matters. And I think you'll see this once we get into Psalm 74. I think we need a little bit of a backstory before we jump in, and then we'll open with prayer. But uh, we have to kind of bear with Asaph tonight. He's going to be the author by the Holy Spirit of the Psalms that we're going to study. And uh, we're told that Psalm 74 is a contemplation, or if you prefer, a meditation of Asaph. And it comes on the heels of the Babylonian invasion, which took place in the year 586 BC. And this was the time when Jerusalem was totally and utterly destroyed. And the psalmist is devastated. And he's just trying to wrap his mind around what has just happened. I just kind of wanted to set the stage so that it's maybe a little bit easier to get through this psalm and understand uh, what the psalmist is writing. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer, if you would join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our time. Loving Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to you for your word, and especially this book of Psalms. It is so rich, has such an impact, so powerful, so applicable to our lives all these generations later. Lord, we're so thankful that you inspired the writers to pen these songs, these psalms, that here we are in the year 2019, reading, studying, understanding, and applying to our lives. So Lord, will you bless our time together in your word? Will you speak clearly to us? Help us, Lord, to give you our undivided attention so our minds don't wander because we don't want to miss anything that you have for us, anything that you desire to minister to us. So, Lord, get our attention and keep our attention as only you can by the Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump into this contemplation of Asaph. Verse 1, O oh God... Why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, which you have redeemed, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Lift up your feet, verse 3, to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men, verse 5, who lift up axes among the thick trees, and now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. You have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Can you just hear the cry of the psalmist's heart, Lord? How long are you going to allow this to continue? Do you not see what they did? Do you not care about what's happened? How long, Lord, are you going to let this go on? Verse 11. Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? The right hand speaks of strength. <laughs> this is kind of bold. Again, don't be too hard on him. 
He's just witnessed the unthinkable destruction of Jerusalem. He says this to God, pretty bold, speaking of his hand, take it out of your bosom and destroy them. It's almost as if he says, God, what are you waiting for? What's taking you so long? And then verse 12, kind of turns a little bit of a corner here, thankfully. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Could you imagine if it got worse? He says, for God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. That's more like it, Asaph. Now we're talking. Verse 14, you broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty waters, rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You, verse 17, have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this. Oh, I see where he's going with this. That the enemy has reproached, O oh Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. That's some pretty intense imagery. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. Oh, verse 21, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. In other words, don't let them get away with it. You're not going to let them get away with this, are you, Lord? The tumult of those who rise up against you increases continually. It's as if there's no end in sight. Certainly, God, you have remained silent. Why do you not act? Why do you not move your hand? Why do you not make haste to move your mighty hand as only you can? To me, this is why it is that Asaph is so troubled, even dismayed. It's what he sees and perceives as God's silence and inaction. Certainly, God could do something about what they are doing effortlessly, in an instant, yet he doesn't. I suppose you could say that he's having a crisis of faith, and it's not for the reason that one might think. He knows full well what God is able to do. That's not his problem. That's not the crisis of faith that he's having. The crisis for him is that for some reason, God has deemed fit to remain silent and do nothing. And he's having a really hard time with this. Have you ever had that experience where you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? And the, the silence is deafening. Oh God, why don't you answer me? Don't you see what's going on? Why do you remain silent, O oh God, in the face of this? Do you not care? That's what he's saying. Do you not care what's happening? Lord, do something. 
and don't delay. We're in trouble. And unless you do something and move your hand on our behalf, then this is how it ends. So here's a question. Why is it that God in His sovereignty will choose to remain silent? Why is it that God will allow someone like Asaph, this psalmist, this composer, this musician, this songwriter, if you prefer, who's having a crisis of faith, be inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the words to a psalm that is so troublesome. Why is God allowing him to go through this and seemingly is doing nothing about this? Why is he silent? Why do the prayers just seem to bounce off the ceiling and God just seemingly is unresponsive? One of the things I'm learning in my life, in my walk with the Lord, is that God in His sovereignty will choose to remain silent so that I will learn to humbly depend completely and only upon Him. And in so doing, He's teaching me to trust Him when everything around me contradicts everything that I know to be true about Him. The circumstances of my life contradict the goodness of God. That's a crisis of faith. It's akin to the often asked question of questions of why is it that God allows evil to continue unchecked? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Why is it that this is happening. What is God doing? I don't understand. This was Job's problem, wasn't it? We just, probably one of the most fascinating studies. I know I say that about all of our studies through all the books of the Bible, but Job in particular was such a fascinating Bible study through that book. And you come to the end of this inexplicable evil that has visited this godly man. He was a godly man. This made absolutely no sense. And God is silent throughout the whole thing. Unresponsive. There's, there's no answer from him. In fact, with Job, and we have it recorded, thankfully, this is his lament. He's crying out to God in this condition that he's in as he scrapes these boils that are itching to no end. He's lost everything. And he's also been on the receiving end of these so-called friends who should have remained silent. <laughs> and as soon as they open their mouths, they, it's an understatement to say it this way, but they added insult to unspeakable injury, made matters so much worse. But Job just could not understand why it is that God was silent. Don't you see what's happening here, Lord? I don't understand what you're doing here, Lord. It's as if the Lord's saying in His silence, ah, trust me. Yeah, but God, everything is falling apart. I know. Trust me. Yeah, but Lord, I don't understand. I don't want you to lean on your own understanding anyway. 
Because if you didn't understand, wouldn't you lean on that understanding? And in leaning on your own understanding, would that also mean that you would not lean on me? Ah, yeah. Wouldn't that also mean Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Oh, we know it well. We sing it. We memorize it. We have it up on our walls. Doesn't that also mean that I'm forced, for lack of a better word, to trust in you with all of my heart? Yeah, that's the whole point. That's why this is happening. You're teaching me to trust you on a deeper level, a level that I would have never been able to learn had this not happened. Yeah, but it really hurts. It's very painful. I know. I know. Yeah, but Lord, I, <laughs> you promised that you will never give us more than we can bear up under. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We say it this way, God will never give you more than you can handle. Okay, but I don't think that, I mean, we're really close on this one. I mean, Lord, you think way too much of me if you think I'm able to handle this, because I don't think, if you take me one inch further <laughs> on this, that, that's the breaking point for me. <laughs> don't you think God knows that? Don't you think God knows what your breaking point is better than you know what your breaking point is? I <laughs> think of the when you're disciplining your children, it's kind of like, okay, 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 uncle, uncle. I can't take anymore. Oh, yes, you can. God knows what we're able to bear up under. You know, there's a, a condition, a physiological, medical condition. I don't know the clinical name for it, but basically it's this you are unable to feel pain whatsoever. Now, at first you think to yourself, actually, I would like to have that condition <laughs> because I, I, I find myself wanting to numb the pain in my life. No, 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 no. Think about this. Um, you can't feel pain. What happens if you cut yourself badly and you don't know it because there's no pain? How about this one? Worse yet, uh, something internally. You know, the pain is the uh, warning lights that something's wrong. Something's wrong. Alarm, alarm, pain, pain, something's gone wrong. Well, what happened? You get a headache and it doesn't go away. Maybe that's the warning sign that there's something more serious going on. But what if you can't feel that pain? How are you going to know that there's a brain tumor? You don't feel that internal pain. How are you going to know that there's not something more serious going on in there. Pain is good. Pain is an indicator that something's wrong. Something's wrong. And if I don't experience that pain, then I'm not going to go to the great physician, as it were. When I don't experience pain and things are going so well in my life, isn't it true that the Lord is distant? Isn't it true that when I'm experiencing adversity, adversity strikes, I'm in pain, I'm struggling, I'm going through something very difficult, something I don't understand, doesn't that just drive me to the Lord? Maybe that's the whole purpose of it. Maybe this is the Lord's way of saying, you know, I can't get your attention any other way. I mean, when things are going good, it's kind of like your prayer life. Here's your prayer life when things are going good. 
Thank you, Lord. Bless me, bless them, bless this, bless that. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Really? Now let adversity strike. Let pain hit. Oh, God! Like we just read in the Psalms. Oh, Lord! And the prayer becomes a cry. And then that cry is that which God hearkens unto when he hearkens unto the voice of our cry. So Asaph is in a very difficult position here. He's having a crisis of faith here in Psalm 74. Enter Psalm 75, verse 1. We're told that this is to the chief musician, set to do not destroy, again, a psalm of Asaph, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. Whoa. Is this the same guy? Yeah. This, is this the next song? Yeah. <laughs> what happened between Psalm 74 and 75? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let's read on. We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. Wait, did you hear that? When I choose the proper time. Oh. Because it seems like it was a long time in Psalm 74, and now God's saying, when I choose the proper time. See, Psalm 74 wasn't the proper time. Psalm 75, now is the proper time, and I will judge uprightly. The earth, verse 3, and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly, selah, again, stop, consider, meditate, pause. I said to the boastful, verse 4, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn, do not lift up your horn on high, do not speak with a stiff neck, for exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Notice something absent from verse 6. No mention of the north. Wait, we got east, west, south. Where's the north? <laughs> Here's a thought. It's believed that God dwells on high northward. That's where exaltation comes from. He exalts the humble, he humbles the exalted. Exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. And here are my two favorite words in verse 7, and your two favorite words too, I think, right? But God. What do we know to be true about the power of those two words, but God, it changes everything. But God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Listen to this picture and, and imagine this in your mind's eye. There is this cup in the hand of the Lord and the wine is red. You don't want to drink from this, by the way, spoiler alert. <laughs> it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. It's the cup of his judgment that they will drink deeply from. But, verse 9, I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Very different tune than Psalm 74. Verse 10, all the horns of the wicked I will also cut off. 
but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Here's what I'm thinking. We all have a Psalm 74 in our lives. There are going to be those times in our walk with the Lord where we're going to walk through the valley of a Psalm 74 where we're going to taste from the cup of a Psalm 74. But God <laughs> also has for us a Psalm 75. And a Psalm 75 is the answer to the dilemma, the problem of those Psalm 74 seasons in our life. When God seems to be afar off, distant silent. And it seems like it's going on far too long. And we cry out, oh Lord, how long, how long? And then Psalm 75 comes and the Lord says, it's time. Yeah, but Lord, you kind of took too long on that. No, I didn't. <laughs> you know, we say, it's almost really cliche, God's timing is perfect. Don't you hate that when you're going through a trial and some well-meaning Christian tries to just start spouting off all these clay. We know that all things work together for the good. You know, it's in those times, you just kind of think to yourself, you know, I know that. You don't think I know that? <laughs> You're not where I'm at. You're not tasting from that which I am tasting from. Easy for you to say, we say, right? I think we should be very careful when somebody's going through a really difficult time, uh, I was thinking about this. In fact, I was listening to a really good teaching today about Job, happened to be from Ravi Zacharias, whom I'm a huge fan of. And he made this comment. He said, you know, we need to learn the lesson of Job's friends because what Job needed was not their mouths, he needed their hand and their arm around them, saying nothing to them. Sometimes when God is silent, the best thing we can do is be silent. Psalm 75 is coming, but we're just going to have to wait. When the time comes, God will choose the right time, then God will act. He's never late, but he's never early either. And truth be known, we don't want him to be early because if he's early, then we are robbed of the lesson that we would have learned, should have learned, could have learned, had we but waited. I think of Isaiah 30 verse 18. The Lord says that he will wait He'll take his time. It'll seem like a long time. It'll, it'll seem like he's silent, doing nothing. Why? So he can be gracious unto you. You ever seen the delays of God as the grace of God? What's grace? Unmerited favor? It's God giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. I find myself so often in my prayer journals in the morning just entering in those words, Oh God, thank you for your grace and mercy. Oh my goodness. I need them both. Don't you? I need, his, I need Him to not give me what I do deserve. Oh my goodness, I need that. That's His mercy. 
But I also on the other side of that need for him to give me what I don't deserve. That's his grace. And sometimes we need to give God the elbow room, the space, the time to do what he's going to do. Because it takes time. That's why it seems like he's taking his time before he finally says, okay, now it's time. Oh, I like those words. I like the word now. It's evidenced in how I pray. <laughs> because just like any, you know, child who's five years old, I want what I want, when I want it, the way I want it, and I want it now. You know that humorous quip, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Really? It, it, those are one of those prayers. I appreciate what Artie shared on Tuesday night at our prayer meeting about, um, you know, his wife, Michelle, absolute miracle. We're just all rejoicing in what God did. But I think it was something to the effect of you prayed, God, draw me near to you. Oh, very dangerous. It's one of those prayers that should come with the warning, you know, uh, it's kind of like, <laughs> before you pray this prayer, you probably should know what you're praying. So it's, it's like this, this prayer. This is a, another very dangerous prayer. Oh God, teach me to be a man of prayer. Wait, did you just really pray that? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. You want me to make you a man of prayer? Yes. What are you thinking? That God's just going to give you one of those prescriptions? Prayer in a bottle? Take one pill? And you'll be a man of prayer. Oh, I wish it was that easy. You want me to make you a man of prayer? I'll give you kids. That'll make you a man of prayer. <laughs> And, the, and these kids are going to grow up and be teenagers. You'll be on your knees before you know it. You wanted me to make you a man of prayer? Well, let me tell you how I'm going to make you a man of prayer. I'm going to orchestrate the circumstances in your life. I'm going to choreograph the steps of your walk with me in such a way that you will realize, and this is not hyperbole when I say this, and I say this as one who has come to this place in my own life. I want to be careful how I say this so you don't misunderstand me. God will bring us to that place where it is minute by minute that we are humbly dependent upon Him, where we find ourselves continually talking to Him in prayer throughout the day, hour by hour, minute by minute. Lord, I just got this email. It's not like the Lord does, doesn't know. You got an email? Oh, when, when did you get this? No. You know, our directional prayers, Lord, you know, they, I just got this phone call. I know, I'm all knowing, I'm all present, I'm all power. I'm kind of already, I knew the phone call was going to come before the phone call came. In fact, get this. I knew that you would gonna get that phone call, that disturbing phone call, before the foundations of the earth. Way before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew that you were going to get that call on this day. How about that? Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord says, I do. Let's talk about it. Talk to me about this, because I can do something about this. You know, it's interesting, and I, I only speak of myself because I'm so guilty of this, but you know how it is when something happens and we call everyone but the one that can actually do something about it. 
right? I mean, at best, that genuinely caring brother or sister in Christ, the only thing they can do is empathize with you. So you're in a situation, got a financial problem, marriage problem, family problem, parenting problem. So you call so-and-so, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. And how long will you spend on the phone? And if they're loving enough and care enough, they'll probably just listen as you just go on and on and on and you're laying it all out to them. Here, here's the thing. When you talk to God, you don't even have to lay it out. He already knows everything about it. So you can just sort of cut right to the quick and say, okay, Lord, <laughs> Just this, this morning, I was, I'm dealing with a situation, and um, I said, Lord, um, can I talk to you about this? And I'm kind of one of these kinesthetic, kind of, you know, always kind of have to be sort of moving, and it's not, is that the right word, kinesthetic? I asked somebody correct me in love. Kinetic, kinesthetic, I don't know. It's one of those words that have very different meanings. But anyway, you have to kind of be moving. So I, my best time in prayer is walking back and forth, just talking to the Lord in my office, Lord. And it's a dialogue, you know, prayer is a dialogue, not just a monologue. So I'll, I'll have my Bible software open and I will just, you know, seek him, petition his throne, say, okay, Lord, I mean, um, I don't know what to do about this you do, what do you want me to do? And then he'll speak chiefly through his word. And sometimes it'll be that one verse, a word fitly spoken, a prophetic word really that speaks very specifically to that situation. Oh, thank you, Lord. Sometimes the answer I'll get is wait, just wait. Don't do anything. Don't say anything. Don't reply. Oh, how many times have I sent an email that I wish I could unsend? Man, once you click that mouse or touch that, that trackpad and push send. I, I've never regretted an email that I didn't send. And conversely, there have been so many times that I've regretted an email I did send, or something I said. I wish I could unsay it. You can't unsay it. You said it, man. And who had I but just waited for the Lord patiently and not rushed ahead of Him to fill in this blank line. Because I was, you know, we're always taught growing up, don't leave the line blank. If you don't know the answer, guess. On a job application, don't leave a blank, they'll think you forgot it. So put N-A, not applicable. Just don't leave that line blank. Whatever you do, don't leave the line blank. Put something there. So that's what we do. We try to fill in the blank of the Lord saying, why don't you let me put the, the right answer on that blank line in your life? Well, just let, wait for me to do it. It's like we push the hand of God out of the way. No, I got it. Here's the bottom line. We'll move on to Psalm 76. I, I really want to get to Psalm 77 tonight. If we don't, that's all right. We'll just have to wait <laughs> patiently till next week, Lord willing. But here's the bottom line. God will absolutely not remain silent indefinitely. He will choose the time and when he does, it will be perfect and he will always ultimately have the final word. God 
rules over all and overrules all. And we're going to again see that in Psalm 77. So let's tackle Psalm 76. Verse 1, again, to the chief musician on stringed instruments, another Psalm of Asaph, a song. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword of battle, Selah. You, verse 4, are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted, verse 5, were plundered. They have sunk into their sleep, and none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. You yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment, and He will arise to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. Selah. Verse 10. Pay particular attention to verse 10. We're going to talk about this. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is, and some of you are going to really appreciate this word, because we've talked about it. Awesome! He is awesome! He is awesome to the kings of the earth. Why do I make such a big deal about the word awesome? Because as I've shared, it's a word that we have marred. We have used this word reserved, I believe, only for God and we have brought it down, profaned it, made it common, and used it for man. And in so doing, we have lost what the meaning of the word is. To be awesome is to be in awe. To be in awe. God, I am in awe of you. You are awesome. Let's talk about this verse 10 where Asaph is inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the words about how God will surely make the wrath of man to praise him. What does that mean? That means, see it this way, that means that God can take and make the evil of man to serve his end in the end so that at the end we praise him. I was having devotions with my daughter and, and we were talking about Joseph and I was kind of setting the stage about, you know, how it all went down and, and how it all came to this point 17 years later. And he has been on the receiving end of unspeakable evil at the hands of his brothers who left him for dead, then sold him into slavery, betrayed him. When we were there in the book of Genesis, for those of you who were with us, oh my goodness, how many years ago was that we were in? Genesis at this rate will be through the Bible in the year 2046. Isn't that the year, Tom? 2046. So 
but it's very detailed in the narrative. We're told that when Joseph was in the bottom of that pit, before they sold him into slavery, and would end up in Egypt. Talk about God ruling over all and overruling all. God, it was, I mean, God's going perfect. Everything is going perfectly according to my plan. If there was ever a man that, like Job, could have complained about why God was allowing all of this to happen to him, it was Joseph. Never once do we hear even the mention or the hint of a complaint on his part. And that was just the beginning of the story. I mean, it, get, it get, goes from bad to worse. He gets to Egypt, and then he's a slave, and then he gets promoted because this is a gifted and called man of God. And everything he touches is blessed because it's the blessing of God on his life. And he catches the attention of his boss, one Potiphar, who puts him in charge of everything. The only problem is he's got a a wife who is, uh, we're told, seducing him every single day, every single day. And on one particular day, she gets all of the servants out of the house, and then she throws himself at him. And I was very careful and generic in this particular part in my uh, the devotional with my daughter. You know, I didn't want to get too graphic, but basically she's, uh, you know, saying, hey, no, nobody's here. And his response is, I could not do this evil to the Lord. And he runs. And what does she do? She grabs his coat and falsely accuses him of attempted rape. He should have been killed. That was a crime punishable by death. But Potiphar knew, believe me, he knew his wife. And he also knew Joseph. And he knew Joseph would never do that. He knew his wife would do something like that. So instead of killing him, everything's going perfectly according to plan. He throws him into prison, this dungeon. And there he interprets the dreams of two men, affectionately referred to as the buck, Bucker, Bucker, Butler and Baker. That's a combination of Butler and Baker. Bucker, we'll call them <laughs> the Buckers, the Bucker brothers. I don't know. So <clears throat> He interprets their dream, and sadly, he says, you know, to the baker, um, you're dead. He says to the butler, you're going to be restored. And by the way, butler man, <laughs> when you are restored, will you remember me? Because I'm here unjustly. I've been falsely accused of a crime I did not commit. So what happens? He gets restored. He's now the cupbearer again for Pharaoh and completely forgets Joseph. And here he is, left to rot in this dungeon. Don't imagine being incarcerated like we understand being incarcerated today. You were thrown in this dungeon to die. That's it. That's how it ends. So what does God do? Well, just wait. No hurry, no worry. Everything's going perfectly according to plan. When the time came, not a moment too soon, God's never late, God's never early. He gives Pharaoh a really intense dream. And Pharaoh goes to his men and he says, I'm not even going to tell you what the dream is. If you really uh, are who you say you are, you're going to tell me what I dream, and then you're going to interpret the dream. And they're all going, it ain't going to happen. And that's when our butler friend says, oh, wait a minute. I know somebody that can tell you what your dream was and interpret the dream. Well, what are you waiting for? Go get him. Well, he's in prison. You'll have to sign his release, his weekend pass. <laughs> Brings him before Pharaoh, and God gives Joseph Pharaoh's dream, and then he interprets the dream and says, here's what's going to happen, and here's what, what you dreamed, and here's what it meant. The seven lean cows, that's seven years of famine that will come subsequent to the seven fat cows, which are seven years of plenty. You need to store up during the seven years of plenty so that you have enough during the seven years of famine. Pharaoh's gone, you're hired. He becomes the most powerful man in the world, the known world, next to Pharaoh, who they actually saw as a god. Everything's going perfectly according to plan. So now the famine has reached the land of Canaan, and dad 
says to his brothers, hey, uh, you need to go to Egypt and get some grain. I hear they have stores of grain. So they go to Egypt, and who should they? What a coincidence, right? What a coincidence. Wow. What are the odds? So they, they don't know it's Joseph. Joseph knows it's them. He gets a little bit emotional, you might say. And he starts accusing them of being spies. And they protest, no, our dad sent us. That's, that's his dad. They don't know it. We have brothers. Oh, really? Okay, I'll tell you what, if you're really not spies, you're going to leave one of the brothers here. You're going to go back and get your youngest brother. That was his biological brother, by the way, Benjamin. So they go back, he puts the money, that freaks them out. Because now they're like, oh my goodness, we paid him the money, and not only do we have the grain, we have the money. And they go back to dad and say, okay, here's what happened, here's what went down. Dad says, um, <laughs> I've lost Joseph, as far as he's concerned, as far as they're concerned, Joseph's dead. And now you want to take Benjamin? And he says, and the, the, the text doesn't even really capture the intensity of it. He says, everything is against me. He has no idea what God is about to do. He reluctantly sends Benjamin back with them. They show up. Joseph meets with them. And he becomes so overcome by emotion. You got to know, he loved his brothers so much. When he's in that pit, I forgot to mention this, the text says he was screaming, crying, why are you doing this to me? He's pleading with them. So he has to actually excuse himself. He goes into another chamber and he's wailing so loud, certainly his brothers heard him. So he tries to dry his, eyes, dry his eyes, perhaps unsuccessfully. He goes back into the chamber where his brothers are, and he reveals his identity to them. It's me. And <laughs> they become so fearful, like, uh-oh. In fact, it's interesting, on the way back the first time, I think it's Judah says something to the effect of, what's just happened to us, we have to go back and get Benjamin, explain this to dad. What's happened to us is God punishing us for what we did to Joseph. So now, can you imagine what was going through their minds when the most powerful man in the world is the brother that they did this to, that they thought was dead? And they're so fearful, like, okay, he, all he, he doesn't even have to say a word. He snaps his fingers, it's off with their heads. And they knew it. That's how powerful he was. And what does he say? Genesis 50, 20. My favorite verse in all the Bible, <laughs> along with all the other favorite verses in all the Bible. No, but this one in particular. But God, this is the but God verse of but God verses in the Bible. He says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, you, what you did to me, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good for the salvation of many this day. In other words, God made the evil that you did praise him, bring glory to him. That's making the wrath of man, the evil of man, to praise and glorify God. And that's what this psalm is all about. Let me say it this way. It doesn't matter how bad it is, it cannot and will not change how good God is. You know, we flippantly, I'm sorry to say it that way, we flippantly 
quote Romans 8, 28. Talk about cliche. We've almost, how do I say it? We've almost gutted out the power of this promise because we're, we're so familiar with it. For we know that God works all things together for the good. To them that love him and are called according to his purpose. Of course, verse 29 explains and defines what that purpose is. It's to make us more like Christ. That's his purpose. Make us more like Jesus. That's his purpose. But here's the thing. It may be evil. It may be bad. It may be unbearable. But God, as only he can, will make it to praise him. In the end, it will always be for his glory and your good. Period. Yeah, but this is really bad. This is really, really bad. Well, you know what this psalm was written about? It was written about that time when the Assyrian army had encamped around Jerusalem, and it meant certain death. In fact, whenever the mighty Assyrian army would besiege a city, they would just surrender. Some would just commit suicide in order to not be in the hands of the Assyrians who were evil through and through, merciless beyond description. They would impale, skin alive those whom they had captured. It was just evil what they would do. And here they are now, surrounded around Jerusalem. God! <laughs> uh, no, 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 just, I'll make the evil of the Assyrians to praise me. Watch me now. You want to know how? We talked about this earlier in the Psalms. It's in 2 Kings 19.35. Picture the scene. The Assyrians have encamped around Jerusalem. It's just a matter of time before they capture them and do unthinkable things to them. And God just says, no, 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 no. I'm going to make the evil of man to praise me. You know how I'm going to do it? Oh, it's going to be really cool. 2 Kings 19.35. Watch this. And it came to pass on a certain night, that the angel of the Lord went out. It's not even, we don't even know the name of the angel. It's not Gabriel. It's not Michael. It's, it's not, it's like this, you know, trainee, this intern, no name angel, just kind of like, hey, you, what's your name? Let me see your name tag. You get over here. We're going to have you go down and take care of this problem because, see, there are 185,000 Assyrians surrounding Jerusalem. I just need one, one angel, just one. So on a certain night, the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. He just killed them, 185,000. And then when the people arose early in the morning, they, they slept through this whole thing. The Assyrians have surrounded now the city, and they wake up, they arise early in the morning, and <laughs> there were the corpses all dead. I make the wrath, the evil of man to praise me. Yeah, they meant it for evil, but God, He meant it for good. They're good and his glory. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way, so perfect is his government that by judgment he compels evil to serve his purpose, making the wrath of men to praise him. Psalm 77. This is to the chief musician. Again, it's a Psalm of Asaph. It's to Jeduthun, verse 1. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. I want you to, 
as I read this, as you follow along, I want you to use your God-given imagination and just kind of picture what Asaph is going through again here. His hands stretch out at night without ceasing means that he is just praying, lifting up his hands, lifting up his voice, crying out to the Lord all night long. My soul refused to be comforted. You know how that is sometimes? Where nothing calms you. Nothing comforts you. It's like your soul is rejecting any consolation, any comfort. Verse 3, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained. And my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. You, verse 4, hold my eyelids open. <laughs> this kind of has the idea of, you're not going to let me sleep. You know, we talk about having toothpicks in your eyes to keep them open. It's like God saying, uh, I'm going to keep your eyes open and you're not going to sleep. No rest is going to come to your eyes. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Have you ever been so vexed that there are just no words, only moans? I, verse 5, have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance, verse 6, my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will He be favorable no more? Has His mercy ceased forever? Has His promise failed forevermore? Has God, verse 9, forgotten to be gracious? Has He in anger shut up His tender mercies? Selah. Wow. And I said, verse 10, we're going to turn another corner here, thankfully. Oh my goodness, could you imagine the whole psalm like this? And I said, this is my anguish, but, this is a very important word here. It's a but God moment. He says, but, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, verse 13, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Wait, is this the same guy that started off the psalm saying things, writing things like, God, have you completely forgotten me? Are you so angry with me that you've shut up your mercy and I'll never know your mercy again? And now he's saying, but, kind of coming to his senses. I will remember, I will remember, I will remember, I will meditate. I want to talk about that. Different than just remembering. And not only will I meditate, I will communicate. What? Yeah, he says, I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. And then he says, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You, verse 14, are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. We just talked about him, Selah. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. What a picturesque description. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. What's going on here? What in the world is this psalm about? Well, 
If you just hang in there with me for a couple minutes, I want to share with you some thoughts about what I believe is a man who is on the brink of a nervous breakdown. Is it okay if I say that? You'll forgive me. I mean, he is, <laughs> he's about to lose his mind here. That's in verses 1 through 9. He, he's, he's about to snap. And then verse 10, he goes, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what? It's almost like he says to himself, what are you doing? What are you saying? It's not, has God forgotten you? It's, have you forgotten God and what He's able to do? Have you forgotten what He did for Joseph and Jacob with Moses and Aaron? Have you forgotten? Don't you remember? So he, he comes to his senses in verse 10, and he remembers what God had done in the past. And not only does he recall the goodness and the faithfulness of God, but he meditates on it. Again, stay with me on this. This carries with it the idea of a cow chewing its cud. You'll forgive the the graphic illustration here, but this is what it means to meditate on Scripture. The cow has, I guess, something like six stomachs. Can you imagine? And so it, it chews and then swallows and then regurgitates and chews and gets more out of it, then swallows it and keeps going back and forth and back and forth. That's what this means to meditate on the Word of God, to digest it, to chew on it, to let it assimilate and, and I'm sorry, regurgitate it and chew on it some more. Really meditate on this and really digest this. So in other words, it starts with remembering what God has done. And then when I remember it, I meditate on it. I chew on it. I think about it. I regurgitate it. I digest it. And then I talk about it in the sanctuary. And that's what changes everything. That's what turns his depression and despair into hope. I'll bring the Bible study to a close, but if you'll just indulge me for just a bit longer, I think I'd be grossly remiss if I didn't at least mention this, and I want to close with a couple of quotes that have been very um, helpful to me in my own life. But it's been my experience, and it's my belief that the enemy seeks to attack the mind in this way. You know, our minds are fallen, right? We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind. This is the renewing of our minds. And Satan knows that the battleground's in the mind. And sadly, the enemy has been met with a measure of success in attacking the mind of God's people, putting thoughts in our minds, planting seeds of doubt, fear in our minds. And then we start meditating on that, digesting it. And it's not long before we plummet into this bottomless pit of despair. What's going to get us out of that pit of depression, that pit of discouragement, that pit of despair? It's remembering and meditating and communicating the goodness of God. And we're the first ones that need to <laughs> hear that. The first quote is from Oswald Chambers. Actually, this comes from his commentary on the book of Job, and it's titled, Baffled to Fight Better. Interesting title. Listen to what he says. Satan's aim is to make a man believe that God is cruel and that things are all wrong. But 
When a man strikes deepest in agony and turns deliberately to the God manifested in Jesus Christ, he will find him to be the answer to all of his problems. In other words, Satan's chief goal is to put these thoughts in our minds that God is not fair, God is not just. It certainly could be said, I would argue, that this is what happened to Asaph in the Psalms that we've studied tonight. Where he's starting to question the goodness of God, almost implying the cruelty of God instead. Ah! Satan's got another mark up on the board as a win. Because that's his aim. By the way, nothing new under the sun. He started this in the garden, didn't he? With Eve? Huh. God's holding out on you. God's uh, unfair to you. He doesn't want you to be like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be God. That was his whole aim. That was his chief goal. Here's the last quote, and then we'll close. It comes from D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and it's from a, a book I have in my library. It's been a tremendous resource over the years. It's titled Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Its Cure. Listen to what he says. In the last analysis, the one and only cause of spiritual depression is the devil, the adversary of our souls. He can, listen, he can use our temperaments and our physical condition, and there is no end to the ways in which the devil produces spiritual depression. We must also bear him in mind the devil's one object is to so depress God's people. Indeed, I can put it finally like this. The ultimate cause of all spiritual depression is unbelief. It's what one has called unbelieving believers. It is because we listen to the devil instead of listening to God. And dare I add, we believe the devil instead of believing God. We believe the lie of the devil and we don't believe the truth that is God. We're unbelieving believers. We listen to the devil instead of listening to God that we go down before him and fall before his attacks. That's what these psalms were basically about tonight. The attack of the enemy on the mind of man. Trying to get man to believe him, listen to him, and not listen to God, and not believe God. Because the lie of the devil is, God can't be trusted. God is not. If God were good, why would he be allowing this to happen to you? Or how about this? And we brought it up at the beginning. If God is so good, if God is so loving, then why does he allow evil to continue in the world? Oh, not for long. There's coming a day. He'll have the final word. His judgments are righteous. He is just and he is fair. And he will have the final word, never will there be anyone in heaven that will say, huh, I don't know if that was right. No. Nor will there be anyone in hell, listen, who will ever say, I shouldn't be here. No. His judgments are just. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Thanks for your patience, by the way. Father in heaven, I, wow, <laughs> pretty intense tonight, but maybe that's a good thing. 
it strikes at the, the depths of our struggles in this life, in this fallen world. But like Oswald Chambers says, when we come to you, we find manifest in the person of Jesus Christ the answer, the final answer to all of these dilemmas, all of these problems. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.